spot a fool. Uh, I'm going to throw that out and don't point. No pointing. How do you spot a fool? How do you spot a fool? Court jester outfit on? I don't need the costume. Look in the, thanks a lot, Roy. Look in the mirror. Oh, n without pointing, that was barbed. Okay, how do you spot a fool? Good. What makes a fool a fool? Maybe it's good that we start with this. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. I think that helps us understand a little bit uh, the profoundness of what a fool really is. So a fool has been given evidence that something is true, but doesn't come to the same conclusion. Or the, the person knows something to be true, but does not respond in an appropriate way. So when it says the fool says in his heart there's no God, it could be that he sees all this evidence, there must be a God, there must be a creator, there must be somebody responsible for all this. Um, that would be the natural assumption, but some would say, no, it, it just happened. That's a fool. Or it could be that they know there's a God, but they don't want there to be a God. And so the fool says, the evidence is here, but I'm, I don't want to respond appropriately to the, the truth that is, that is likely there. Now we can see that in a, in a plain sense, that some people are just plain ignorant to some things. They don't, they don't come to conclusions by all the evidence that's there, and they just can't come to those. And so some people are fools for that reason. Some people are just fools in the way that they respond to situations. They know better. You ever felt that way? You should know better than that. And so that is definitely the pattern of a fool. So the opposite of that is a wise person. How do you spot it? We should have started positive. I don't know why we didn't. We started so negatively. How do you spot a wise person? Someone say, look in the mirror. No. <laughs> That was a dumb thing to say. <laughs> yeah. How do you spot a wise person? By their actions? What do you mean? Because there's a lot of people that have actions that are not great. Okay. The morals. Ah, oh, interesting. How they respond to correction. Ooh. A wise man will thank you for that correction. A fool will do what? Continue doing the same stupid thing they've always done. Okay, how else do you spot a wise person? Let me see a show of hands. How many of you have a wise person in your life? At least one. Okay, so think of that person. What makes them wise? Why do you consider them wise? They know what to do in a difficult situation. Good. They follow God. Good. Okay. Ah, they'll listen. They'll understand. Good. They seem to be prosperous in what they do. Interesting. Okay. Ooh, they don't overreact. Okay. Or underreact. So the biblical definition of wisdom is to be skilled in living. So they know, maybe it comes through, and often wisdom comes through experience. They, some, they've learned from their mistakes, meaning that they don't make the same one again. So like a fool would continue doing the same thing. A wise person can foresee uh, the outcome of, of something that you're going to do. So a wise person will, will not just think about the immediate, they'll also think if I do this, this, and this, then this is likely going to happen. And that is often learned through experience. Now, I know a lot of smart people who are fools. Anyone know any of those? You can be very knowledgeable. <laughs> Ron's raising his hand. Uh, you can be very knowledgeable and still be foolish. So you can know all the details about something and yet not respond appropriately. And so a wise person you go to for counsel because you know that the counsel that they're going to give you lines up with and, and would likely accomplish uh, what you're hoping for in the future. It's going to help you through a situation or to see a perspective that you don't see. And so wisdom sees beyond themselves and it becomes skilled in living that they know how to react and respond and so on. 
So we're going to look at these two words, and they're going to be consistently in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in particular, and then into chapter 2. And it's going to talk about the wisdom God and, uh, of God and the wisdom of man and the foolishness of man and so on. And I just wanted to, to have this just in our minds as we're reading it. So when we think of the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man, they're two completely different things. He's not saying it's just that God's a little smarter than you. That's not what he's saying at all. The wisdom of God is completely foreign to you and to me. And it cannot be understood through just reasoning or through study, uh, you know, like intellectual exercise in some way. See, the wisdom of God sees us and sees the situation that we're in for what it is. And he sees that the only solution for the problem that we have is going to be his son. And so he's going to look at this as we, as we read 1 Corinthians. He, he can see the outcome if we keep going in the way that we're going. He sees the solution and he responds appropriately to it. Now the rest of us look at it and the rest of the world in our wisdom look at it and say that is foolishness. God, what God is doing is foolish. It seems reckless and stupid that God would try to accomplish or try to deal with this problem in this way. And we'll look at that. So let's pray and then we're going to read our passage together. Father, even as we read this, I, um, and as I've been studying this, I realize that my own word, my own reasoning, my own uh, preparation here is for nothing if your spirit does not open our eyes to see it. Lord, you tell us in, in the Psalms that you, that just like the psalmist cried, open our eyes that m we might see the wonderful things in your law. And we pray that you would open our eyes in that supernatural way that we can't get just by our mere human understanding or by trying to understand it with our own intellect. There's something divine that needs to happen here for us to grasp what you are doing and what you have done as wisdom instead of folly or foolishness. Lord, everything you do is with purpose. It's perfect. And so we give you praise for it. I pray that we would hold this out like Paul with confidence and with courage and, uh, and I just pray, Father, that you would transform our life by this truth, this wisdom of God. Uh, Lord, as it confronts our own, what we consider our own wisdom, we pray that we would be, just as Paul reminded us, that we would be willing to be corrected and confronted in our folly. And Father, in that, that we would come under, under your wisdom and we would experience the power of God here even today. That uh, demonstration of your power would be for our eyes to be open and our ears to hear correctly and for us to understand what you've done for us. So for those who are wrestling right now, for those who have been trying to figure this Bible thing out, to be able to figure this God person out, I pray that you would all of a sudden just open our eyes to see it, and that's something only you can do. We pray for that miracle to happen today in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those, to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the, of, um, of the world? For since the wisdom of God, since in the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not know him. God is pleased, though, uh, through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things 
and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that, by, uh, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us uh, wisdom from God, that is, our forgiveness, our holiness, and our redemption, or our righteousness, I'm sorry. Therefore, uh, therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now over to chapter 2. And so, it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear, and with trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise or persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So we are going to see this theme throughout this section of wise foolishness, the wisdom of God, and our ability to understand the wisdom of God and see the wisdom of God, you will also see repeated this idea of power. And you'll see in verse 17, tying it to our last week's message, that uh, he did not want to come with eloquent words and fancy preaching and convincing arguments so that the cross of Christ would be robbed of its power. You see, the power of God is in the cross, in the demonstration of God's wisdom in his solution that he gave on the cross. And for us to understand that it, it is done through the Spirit's power. And so the connection of God's power and our ability to see clearly the cross of Christ and what it really means to me and to you is critical. You see, you're not just being made aware of some hidden knowledge that somebody else doesn't have, so you're a little bit smarter. Your, your eyes are being opened to a relationship, to a person. And we recognize that a relationship isn't an intellectual exercise, right? You get that if you're married or, or a person? You don't have relationships because you, you studied them. I don't have a relationship with Connor McDavid because I know all of his stats. Correct? How do I get a relationship with Connor McDavid? not possible you suck at hockey is your appropriate response there I have no I have nothing in common with common McDa Connor McDavid except a very distant relationship none <laughs> met him once in a hallway that's it he has no desire to have a relationship with me so big things are gonna have to change and it's a terrible analogy sort of of what what's happening here remember you're being invited into a relationship the distance and the chasm between us and God is huge because of our sin. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. He came and he died for us. And that's crazy. That's crazy. Why did he come and do that? Not so that you could know all of Jesus' statistics and what he did and, and be able to track and have timelines and understand everything in the Bible, but so that you could have a relationship with him. And that is built and rooted and sourced in the person of Jesus, okay? I'll start unpacking this passage real quick here. Um, I, I think we need to spend some time here because it is such a critical part to our understanding. You see, the gospel is humbling. None of us did something in, in order to earn God's favor. And so he didn't love you over someone else because you did something. Or you weren't smarter than the guy next to you, so you figured it out. Well, they're stupid and they couldn't figure it out. This passage is making it clear that, and, and putting us in our place, that it is because God called or woke you up. There was a supernatural thing that happened in your life that allowed you to understand fully the cross of Christ, and that then brought you into a relationship with God that you did not and could not have on your own merit and by your own wisdom and your own strength and your own understanding or study. So if you've been studying for years and years and years and just haven't broken through, and I don't get it, I don't get this Christian thing, start praying. Ask God to reveal himself and to show himself. A supernatural work needs to happen. The message of the cross is foolishness. It seems so stupid. Uh, first of all, it's going to talk about Greeks and Jews. Foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You'll see two people, two types of people, two groups. There are those who are perishing, going this direction, and those who are being saved, both of those things are in progress. Do you see that? There's one who is progressing towards perishing or death or hell, 
Uh, that is the end result, and it is eternal. And there is one who is progressing towards life, progressing towards salvation, where there is forgiveness of sins, a restoration of a relationship with the Lord, saving from the consequences of sin, which is death, and then given life eternal, which will go on into eternity on the other direction. You don't see someone sitting in the middle. I'm just a neutral, stuck. It is either you are perishing or you are being saved. And so for the person who is perishing, this is foolish. The cross of Christ is foolish because of this. It seems like a dumb plan. And we'll see this just in a second. So people look at it and they mock Jesus because uh, it, his, his plan seems so foolish. It, seems, it made God seem so weak. And for the people which we're going to see here, it was not easy to comprehend or understand because it didn't make sense according to our wisdom. How I would have handled it would have been completely different. Amen? How do you, okay, let me ask a question before I say amen. How would you have handled this whole problem? If, if you knew that people needed saving, how are you going to try to save them? We do it today. We see a country who's in desperate need, in poverty, hungry. We see people around us that are going through difficult times. And hard. How do you try to save them? Pray for them? Meet their needs? Good. So we're going to get to this. The Jews were looking for signs like that. I need somebody to step in here to advocate for me, to fight for me, to physically fight, to meet our needs, to feed me. We're poor, we're impoverished, we're tired, we're hungry, we're sick. So come and solve all the problems. That seems like the wisdom of the world would, would be to do that. Instead, God sends Jesus to die on a cross. And the one that was supposed to be the, sal the Savior is dead. That seems foolish to me. If we were looking for a king, if we were looking for someone to to do miracles like he kept doing, and so this is why it's going to say later, the Jews demanded signs, and the Greeks looked for wisdom. I want to be able to understand. He needs to expand our intellect. We need to be able to understand what's going on, but it seems so crazy what God did instead. As it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Let's go to where we should always do this. We should go to Isaiah where this is found. Let's go quickly to Isaiah chapter 20. 29, where that is a quote from. Paul is quoting from the Old Testament, and often we see in the context, the context helps us to understand the bigger thing that's going on. So if you read the chapters before, Israel is in, in captivity, they're being judged because of their sinfulness, and you, we're in the middle of a bunch of chapters on the woe to this nation, woe to these people, woe to these people, because of their foolishness and because of their rebellion. And so there is, uh, the, Isaiah is writing about the foolishness of man that has caused this division and this separation. But then he says this, the Lord says in verse 13 of chapter 29, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules and they have been, um, that they have been taught. Therefore, uh, once more I will, uh, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish, and the intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. You see, what he said is you built in customs, things that make you feel spiritual, but leave you empty. All these things that you were taught, and the way that you were raised, and the rules that you did, you can do all of those things, you can know all about God, and you can be completely distant from Him. That is true today. You can study... You can go through all the things. You can go, go to church as much as you want, um, but your hearts can be far from him. And so what Paul is quoting here is he's saying, you know, what I want it to do is, is to align a, a legitimate relationship. I want this to be authentic. I want to show you how this is going to happen. And he's going to do that through the cross. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. It's not going to be through rituals. It's not going to be through... See, worldly wisdom, worldly wisdom would actually impose on you more things that you should do in order to have a better relationship with God. Even if you're unsaved, if you don't know God yet, you just need to read your Bible more. 
You need to go to church more. Those are good things, but they don't answer the problem of the heart. So the wisdom of God sees the problem. Your hearts are far from God. You're in rebellion to God. You need saving, salvation for your sins. You need someone to step down and to walk with you, but then to die for you and then to be raised again. It's not more rules, not more traditions, not more things. It is what Christ did. Verse 20. Uh, where's the wise person? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? You see, we can't figure it out on our own. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. Why is that wise of God? It's almost like God was hiding from people from just figuring it out on their own. But we're going to see that later. It's so that no one can boast in themselves. It wasn't because you were somehow more scholarly and I hear this in, the, in, the, in some people's comments, like, I just can't figure it out. Well, it's not about your intelligence and your ability to figure it out. It's all about whether or not you are willing to submit to what Christ has done. That's a simple thing. And so what God is saying here is he actually may be hiding himself in a sense. This is one reason why God spoke through parables at times. When Jesus came and walked on the earth, he spoke in parables because... There was some that would understand and some who didn't. Those who had their eyes opened and God chose to reveal himself in that way and those who did not. And God did this for the sole purpose that we could not get cocky that you somehow figured it out and someone didn't. And so he said he withheld it so that uh, he was also pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. So how are we supposed to respond? Faith. The same faith I have is the same faith that you need to have and the same faith that you need to have and you need to have and you need to have. My faith is no different than your faith. So I have not achieved some level of faith that has brought me salvation that you don't have yet. Faith is my response to the truth of who Jesus is and what he's come to do. And that seems so simple. It almost seems foolish. And here what God is saying exactly he wants us to respond in faith, and this is the common thing that he, he desires of his people. Jesus, your Jews demand signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block, something to trip over to Jews and, and foolishness to Gentiles. I want to just, we just breeze over that, verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. We're a long ways removed from this, and I think it's important that we break down what he just said there. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to preach Christ, the Messiah. Imagine for these Jewish audience, they're anticipating, they're waiting for a Messiah, a king like David to come, sit on his throne forever, to rule over all the nations, to establish a kingdom, and then to provide perfectly for all of his people. That's the Messiah. And Paul says, I'm going to come to all you Jewish people and I'm going to preach that your Messiah came and he was humiliated on the cross. And that's the answer to your problem. You see how ludicrous that is? You see how worldly wisdom would see that as foolishness? Yeah, your Messiah came, and then they hung him on a cross, they mocked him, they ridiculed him, and he allowed himself to do it. Some king. I'll wait for a different Messiah, thank you. And that's what a lot of Jews did. And a lot of Greeks look at that too as weak, as stupid. That doesn't make sense. But Paul goes on and he just says, but we're going to preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block. A lot of people are going to trip on it. They won't be able to believe that that's enough. They want to add to it. They want their own traditions. They want their own wisdom, the things that would make them feel spiritual. And he keeps warning us here, it's not about that. It's not how you feel spiritual because then the glory comes back on you. But to those whom God has called, remember called in the very first verses, called means wake up. Whom God has woken you up to be able to see who he is, brand new, supernatural thing here that has happened. Both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. That's the answer. Christ is the demonstration of the wisdom of God. How deeply he knew us, how deeply he saw our rebellion, how much and how, how far-reaching our rebellion is, and the consequence for our sin, and the recognition that you and I can't actually pay the penalty and then continue living because the wages of sin is. So if I die for my own sin, which I can't do anyway... I can't actually live. So the cost is way too high. You and I can't pay the cost that is demanded of our sin. 
And so it's critical that God provide an answer, and it is in the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. I want to just take you, remind you that this is, does not mean that I'm pretty smart, God's a bit smarter. I understand the world and how it's made and all these different things. God understands it better than me, though. He's not saying that. I'm, we can be pretty strong, but God is just a bit stronger. No, we're in completely different universes as far as how he sees and interprets the world um, and what he sees in us and how, what we understand about ourselves and our world and the problems that we have and the consequences for sin. He sees it in a way that you and I don't. And so the outworking of his love is far greater. Now, this leads to one of the main attributes of who God is. He is holy. Everyone's heard that before? Holy does not just mean pure. Holy means completely unique from, completely set apart from. So unlike, his love is unlike our love. His wisdom is unlike our wisdom. His, it's completely separate, completely different. Let me take you to a passage in Isaiah. I'll read it for you and you don't, don't have to turn there. Um, Isaiah chapter 55 in verse 9, it says this. See, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. He's declaring to us that he is completely different than you and me. And, and so we, we need to be really careful that, that we don't just think of ourselves as on the same plane here. We are dependent on him. My tablet chose to shut down. So here we go. Can someone read the next verses? Where are we, 25? Can someone read 25 to the end of the chapter for me, please? Very good. I want to take you to a passage in Jeremiah. That's, that's how this passage ends. Jeremiah. I think, come on, reboot thing. Jeremiah 9, 23. Jeremiah, there we go. Jeremiah 9, 23. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts, boasts about this, that they have the understanding to know me. That's a relational knowing. That I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justness, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. That word kindness is that. Remember we learned a little Hebrew a few weeks ago? What's loving kindness? Anyone know the word? Chesed. Good stuff. We can un to know his love is a supernatural thing that happens. And so this is why he does not choose wise people. He's, he's putting us in our place here a little bit, Paul. He doesn't say, though, that we're all stupid people. There's only most of us are stupid. Doesn't he say that? Not all of you were wise. Actually, very rarely did God choose uh, those people. And he actually goes, Jesus actually talked about this really hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? It's actually really hard for a very intelligent person to enter the kingdom. What's the hang up? What is Jesus recognizing there? Pride. It's been the sin from the garden. And, it, and right from the very beginning, you don't need God. You can decide what's right and wrong. You can be like God. And so we become gods to ourselves when we have an abundance, when we have all the knowledge we think we need, we have all the things that we, we think we can make our life successful. And so uh, God says that he's going to frustrate that. And one of the ways he does that is by bringing us to the end of ourselves often. And maybe you've been there and then you're left, when you're left with nothing, 
It's a perfect place for God to speak the truth of the cross into. But he's, he's saying here that the one who boasts should boast in the Lord, not as in, the own, in his own abilities. I think that's important. Now we see what he has done. We're not supposed to look into ourselves. Verse uh, 30 here. Verse 30. It is because of him that you are in Christ. Because God did it. It's a supernatural thing that brought you here. You didn't do it on your own. Who has become for us wisdom from God that he is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. See, we don't find our righteousness in ourselves. It's not a righteousness that we manufacture by being a good person or high, of high moral standing, by doing all the right things at all the right times. Then God would love us. That's because that's how I have a relationship with God. Nope. It says he is our righteousness. He has done this through his work on the cross. And so he imputed or gave us a righteousness that we did not have and could not have on our own. He is our sanctification or our holiness. He is then, as he is holy, he has taken us and made us holy. You didn't set yourself apart by being weird. As a weird person, see, I'm unique. I'm, look at the way I dress. Look at the way I act. I'm, not, I'm so unique that God must love me. I'm so unique by the standards that I have or so on. I, you don't create your own holiness. God does that work as well. So he is the one that sets us apart. And lastly, he uses a slavery term, redemption. He uses this word to purchase back. You don't earn any of this. So it's not by what you bring to the table at all. Not your good works. Not your ability to be different. Not your uh, willingness to go to church when everybody else isn't going to church. It's not your ability to do things that you might earn God's favor. That's by paying back. He says, no, Christ has paid the purchase price for us. You and I could not. That all happened in the wisdom of God, of Jesus on the cross. Chapter one, chapter 2, verse 1. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come to you with eloquence of human wisdom. I didn't come with good persuasive arguments in that way. We saw that Acts 17. He did that with the Greeks. It didn't accomplish what he wanted. So he resolved in his heart to preach Christ in the next chapter of Acts 18 to the Corinthians. But I resolved... As I proclaim to you the testimony of God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. There we have it again. This was going to be the sole purpose of my mission. I came to you in weakness and with great fear and with trembling. Now Paul was a highly educated person. He was a Pharisee. A Pharisee of Pharisees. He'd gone through every Jewish ritual. He'd done all these different things. And yet here it says all of those things meant nothing. You see that? Really highly educated, well-renowned among the people, had followed through on all the commands of God as a Pharisee, a Jew among Jews. He was the, the quintessential one that you think would have it all together. But he had nothing apart from Christ. And so he says, I came to you in weakness, that all I come with is the message of the gospel. Not with my own abilities, not with my own background that makes me gives me this confidence but it is because of christ so i came to you with great fear and with trembling this is how he approached the corinthian people meaning that he recognized his dependence on the lord to do anything for him if you have a family member if you have a loved one if we want to reach our community if the world is going to be reached for the gospel we need to be obediently going yes but god must do a supernatural work to open the eyes of our loved ones and of people if you want to get to know him come with a humility, asking and seeking the Lord that he would, he would allow you to see who he is. Verse 4, my message and my preaching were not with wise, this is worldly wise and persuasive words or persuasive arguments, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. What was that? The Spirit's power was that God opened their eyes. That when he preached the foolish message of the gospel, in human terms, that people got it. They looked at it as with wonder, and with anticipation, with faith, that, that was a supernatural work of the, of the Spirit's power. Now, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So here it is. How do we respond by faith? When we read Hebrews chapter 11, we see how faith transformed the lives of people. How does faith and trusting in the finished work of Jesus on the cross transform our lives? Well, it removes the burden of guilt. It gives us a peace that I don't have to earn this somehow, that I'm secure in my relationship with God because Jesus has come and he's not only purchased my salvation, redemption, 
He's given me righteousness that I can't do on my own, and yet he's called me to sanctification or to holiness. And we're in process of being made holy by his spirit and by his word. That's still his work. So our life rests and is dependent on him. And I, I find a lot of joy in that. Because what happens today and what happens tomorrow is in God's hands. And he's using this for his glory. Remember, everything that happens is for his glory. That's how the chapter ends. Not to make much of me, but to make much of him. And so this should, should thrill our heart. It should affect our worship. It should affect our view of our loved ones. It gives us hope because when things seem impossible and difficult, imagine Paul going into brand new areas that have never heard about this. How on earth is this gospel message going to go out? And yet he goes with fear, trembling, and with anticipation, knowing that when he preaches the gospel, that the Spirit's power is going to open their eyes to see the wonder of it. And I'm praying the same thing for you as a church, that you would see in a fresh way how awesome the cross of Christ really is and how much that transforms our life. Father, thank you. Um, I pray that your wisdom would become our wisdom, that the way that we, the lens that we see the rest of our world through, the hope that we have for eternity isn't just, just the grave and then nothing. It is anticipation of glory upon glory. We thank you that that was only made possible through your son. Lord, you saw our desperate need you saw my sinfulness, the things that my own family doesn't know, and yet you still love me. So I thank you for that. I thank you also that uh, you were willing to suffer not just the pain, but also the shame. Lord, what you've called us to as Christians is, is basically the same kind of death. Lord, in this world, we're not going to be understood just as you are not understood. They hated you before they hated us. And so we pray for the courage, the boldness, and also the joy of sharing in your sufferings in that way like Paul shared later. I pray, Father, that we would just see the wonder of being able to experience you in these, in these dark times, knowing that there is resurrection as well as part of this plan that you've given. And so we give you praise for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ for those who are perishing. For all of us, Father, that you would strengthen our faith by your spirit. Lord, do a work in those who have been wrestling with you for years, who have been trying to intellectually understand you, trying to figure it all out, and just cannot. I pray that they would respond to you by accepting what you've done for them, by moving forward with joy and with thankfulness in the provision of your Son. We give you praise for all of these things in Jesus' name.